from the police calling all cars, attention all cars, a bank robbery at 1522 Santa Fe Avenue. Suspects escape in a Buick touring car. License unknown. That's all. Rose and present. Public safety is the perfect performance of police cars, fire engines, and other equipment of this type. Much of this performance depends on the gasoline used. Such equipment cannot use a gasoline unless it is absolutely dependable. It must have qualities of quick starting. It must have surging power. There is a gasoline that you can absolutely depend on. That gasoline is Rio Grande Crack with tetraethyl. It has proved its case in the fact that throughout the great Southwest, where Rio Grande products are sold, more police cars, fire engines, motorcycles, ambulances, and other emergency equipment are powered with Rio Grande cracks with tetraethyl than all other brands combined. You can buy this same fine gasoline at any Rio Grande station. have you personally taken a belligerent attitude against the police officer who, doing his duty, drove up beside you and gave you a ticket because you sped to a safety zone or drove pell-mell through busy traffic as if you were going to a third alarm fire and the burning house was your own. Tonight, I bring you a story which I hope will have a beneficial effect upon you and make you conscious, as a citizen of Los Angeles, of how these men in blue and khaki whether they be pounding a beat, riding in a traffic radio car, or cruising throughout the city on their motorcycles, are constantly protecting your life and your property, even unto death. Tonight's story should teach you two great fundamental truths. First, that the men under my command are fearless and courageous, alert to do their duty, and unselfish in placing their lives on the altar of duty. Secondly, that your police department has made and means to keep this city clean of eastern gangsters and vicious criminal types. Written into this story is the grim death of a traffic officer who fell mortally wounded because he was part of this great law enforcement body dedicated to a -a 24-hour-a-day warfare against crime. Likewise, this story discloses the heroism of a motorcycle officer too faithful to his trust of protecting the public to flinch even when his body was riddled with enough bullets to frighten the average criminal to death. Listen intently. Let this thrilling story impress you that it is your job as a citizen to cooperate with your police department in order that its routine work can be made easier and that it can concentrate upon the great forces of evil. Professor Lindsley will go on with the story. It is the middle of August, 1925. Four men are seated in a stuffy day coat as the Chicago Limited clanks across the yard and slowly rattles over the siding onto Alameda Street. Yeah, fellas, it won't be long now. Let's kill the rest of this bottle before we put into the people. Hey, what's the matter, buddy? You better lay off of that stuff. Well, in a scope. You're telling me? You know, this is the last bottle of good Chicago bootleg left in the outfit. 
If we get into L.A. on this charge, though, we'll all have to drink that 75 cent of pint poison they settled out there. Oh, yeah? Let me tell you something. Anytime this baby drinks bum liquor with all them juicy bangs in Los Angeles waiting to be bumped, you're crazy. You're tell a man. Now, listen, you guys. Don't get her too ambitious. Remember, we're here to get her the door to spring at three fingers apiece. And the sooner we do it, the quicker peach she's going to be out in the open air again. Yeah, but why did we pick on Los Angeles? This ain't any town in the United States with banks in it. You're telling me that, Rudy? But I'm going to tell you something. We ain't in any no good standing back in the shy, see? After that holdup at the Lennox Hotel. And this suburb ain't nothing but overgrown the village with a bunch of a moving the picture cops. Ah, it's going to be a pipe. Yeah? So you think the L.A. cops is easy, huh? Sure they're easy. They ain't never bumped up against any real guys like us from the East. It's going to be like a taking a candy from a kid. <laughs> Chicago boys work fast. In two days, they have staked out the job they intend to pull, and they have also acquired some lady friends. The next night finds them entertaining their companions in a top suey parlor. <laughs> well, how you doing, babe? Oh, I think I'm gonna live. Hey, call Pooh Manchu over, will you? I want some more mushrooms. Hey, sure thing, Bertie Hyman never refused a good-looking dame nothing. Hey! Hey! Come on over there, Charlie. Oh, yo, what's your mother? Maybe so. You like something? Maybe so? Yeah, another order of mushrooms for the lady. Uh, bring another bottle of ginger ale, will you? Yeah, and fill up this dish again with cracked eyes. Say, haven't you got any music in this dump? Oh, oh, yeah, you, you like the music? Yo, Chubby, we get the very fine, uh, number one in first class, uh, playing piano. You put it in the nickel? Music, you come out. <laughs> <laughs> I say, big boy, why don't you take us someplace where they have an orchestra? We want to dance, don't we, Betty? Sure, take us where we can dance, will you, Hanson? No, nah, not tonight, but a little short on dough. Oh, yeah. Just a bunch of cheap cakes, huh? No, we ain't no cheap cakes. Tomorrow night we'll show you how cheap we are. Say, we're going to pull hey, a job. Pipe it down, buddy. Pipe it down. If these the time, I don't know like our speed. It ain't no reason for us to go into a confession, huh? Oh, I don't get that way. We were just kidding. Yeah, wait till I stick it with me in the piano. Well, there you are. There's your music and everything. Come on, baby, let's dance. Say, I sure must be stuck on your hands when you get up and try to dance to that racket. <laughs> Come on, let's go. Okay, you're a good little sport, Betty, and tomorrow night I'm going to paint the town with... Hey, how about you dancing with me, too, kid? Ah, sure. <laughs> hey, what's all this bull about the money you guys are going to have tomorrow? I suppose that's the line to give all of us, huh? Say, hey, babe, after tomorrow we're going to be on easy street. Yeah? Well, where's all this money coming from, a rich uncle me? <laughs> <laughs> Who cares? Are you a policeman? Say, do I look dumb like a Los Angeles cop? <laughs> 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 Come on, you better dance while you can. You can't stay here all night. You think we've got an important case tomorrow without strangers. <laughs> <laughs> it is 11 o'clock on the morning of August 22nd, 1925. The Hellman Bank on Santa Fe Avenue is humming with mid-morning activity. How many ones did you say, Mrs. Sawyer? Ten, please, and the rest in five. Right. One, two, three, four. Oh, why, why, what's the matter? Oh! Give me your hands up. Are you clerk, if you want to live, the keep away from those alarm about Stick up, four of them. You can't get away with this, my man. Why, the idea in broad daylight. Shut up. Whiskers are out. What you as an example. All right, now, don't start a shooting for your half or two, Rudy. Now, come on. All of you guys are behind the counter. You'll get into the safe. Now, come on and step out or I'll burn you down. Now, Bertie, you'll get another customer down on the floor. And you, you pick up with the dough. Okay. Down on the floor, all of them. Me too. Yes, you too. Hey, you Dan the brown suit, don't you try to pull nothing. Down on the floor, all of you. All right, Dad. You'll give your guns on the rest of them, huh? Oh, don't shoot. Don't point that gun at me. I'm going to face it. All right. you do anything but shut your mouth. Hey, Bertie, is that of the dough? Yeah, I got everything that was do. Now we're leaving. Everybody stay put till we get out of the door or we'll blast you. Come on, guys. All right. All right, the pilot. I'm going to take the wheel. What did I tell you? Just the like you're taking the candy from a kid. <laughs> Bank robbers pile into a large black touring car, waiting for them outside, motor running. 
The driver presses the accelerator to the board, and the powerful car leaps out into the stream of traffic on Santa Fe Avenue. A second later, one of the officials of the bank commandeers another car and follows in mad pursuit. Several blocks away at Santa Fe and 8, Officer Oscar Bayer, seated on his motorcycle, passes the time of day with a friend. What are you doing down in this end of town, Oscar? Nothing ever happens down here, and the traffic's too dense for speeding. Yeah, I get you right, Mac, but orders are orders. I sure wish something would happen to break for the monotony, though. Well, you got your race, lad. Look at that madman weaving through the traffic. Huh? He's as good as got a ticket right now. Well, you better hurry. That bird's moving. I'll get him with a traffic signal. And there's another one. Go get him, Oscar. Just, just watch me. <laughs> Police motorcycle slices ahead of the pursuer's car. And weaving in and out of the dense traffic, Oscar Bear streaks down Santa Fe Avenue after the fleeing bandit. The black outlaw, seven feet on two wheels. Bear 50 yards behind him. As the officer unlimited his automatic to shoot the his tires, two gun barrels are first suddenly to the rear window of the black car, and something hard and hot hits Bear on the chest. The speeding motor squares dangerously. Bear straightens it, rips out his service revolver. Bandits return the fire. Bayer zigzags in an attempt to throw off the bandit's aim. On down 7th Street, the gun battle waited at 50 miles an hour. Roaring past intersection, Bayer shouts to traffic policemen who hate to come of their passing cars and join in the chase. Bayer empties his gun, and jamming it under his left arm, he reloads it with his right hand while he steers to the left. The bandit car is momentarily halted by construction work at the tail street. The man who runs out from the street to warn them around the barriers receives a bullet through his hat. At San Pedro Street, a thick stream of traffic going in the opposite direction draws the bandits up short in the stoplight. Traffic officer Wiley E. Smith, attracted by Bear's screaming siren, turns around as the bandit car comes to a screeching stop. Before Bear can shout a warning to him, a shotgun spits death from the bandit car. Smith sways, drops to the ground, then painfully climbs to his knees, trips out his gun, and starts firing at the bandits as Bear joins him, his revolver spitting fire into the black touring car. Motorists, waiting at the stoplight, hastily scrambled to the bottom of their car. They are blind with pain, sickened from the bullet his body has stopped, and the dying Smith are joined by four other officers who come up on the commandeered car. As Bayer steps from the cover of a parked car for a moment, one of the gunmen jumping from the black automobile aims at him. The guns of three of the policemen snuff out the light. <laughs> Two more bandits jump from the car and streak for a nearby parking station. The officers cut off the escape of the fourth robber and order him to surrender. Stop that gun, Mr. You're all washed up. That's telling you, though. Oh! You got him in the arm, will you? Yeah. yeah, let's get the cuffs on him. Hey, you ain't got him yet, this dirty. <laughs> Nothing like a gun butt to quiet him. I'll have to put the cuffs on her. Yeah. Here comes Stevenson. The last thing I saw of him is after those other two guys. How'd you make out, Stevenson? They got away. I hung on to them until I ran out of ammunition. Say, there. You're hit. Yeah. Well, I'm still on my feet, and something tells me I'm going to. Stay there till we get this bird to the station. Here comes the ambulance now. There, you better get in, too. No, sir. I'm going to the hospital under my own power. $19,000 is found in a bullet riddled satchel in the bandit's car as a private automobile carries Officer Smith to the hospital. And the ambulance rushes the wounded bandit to medical help. Inspector Finlinson, attempting to get coherent statements of the case from the excited officers, meets Oscar Bayer in the hospital corridor. Oh, there you are, Bayer. I've been looking every place for you. Oh, I've been right here, Inspector. I'm waiting for word about Wiley. Have you heard anything? He's pretty bad, Oscar. Shot through the lung. He's losing blood fast. Oh, poor Wiley. He's pretty ratcheted him down in cold blood. How's the guy we brought in? Never mind him. I want to know how you are. Oh, I'm okay. I just got a few little scratches. You should have reported to the doctor before this. Oh, I'm all right, Inspector, honestly. Well, I want the doctor's assurance of that. Yeah, but it's silly, sir. It doesn't look silly from the size of that blood stain on your side. Where? Oh, that. I hadn't noticed that before. All right, that settles it. You're seeing the doctor with me right now. Come on. You didn't hear it. Here's the bear, Doctor. He seems to think he's a human target. Look him over, will you? Certainly. All right, young man, right over here. Flip your uniform off. Yes, sir. Oh! Just a scratch, uh, bear. Here. Let me see, bear. Here. Let 
Let me help you, boy. Oh. Come on. Here, you. There we are. Hmm. Now let's get a look at you. Hey, young fellow, you must have been born under a lucky star. What do you mean? One bullet headed for your heart was stopped by your bag. Look at this. Hmm. And another, because it could have killed you, is embedded in your notebook here. See that? Yeah, that, that was close. You know, I, I remember now feeling that hit me. It, it sort of knocked the wind out of me for a moment. Now let me see. One, two... Three flesh wounds. I'll get a dressing on them. Are they serious, Doctor? No, but it's certainly a miracle that they only think the flesh. Any one of them would have killed him if they'd have been an inch nearer the center of his body. Well, there you are, Doctor. They can't get rid of me. Only the good die young. <laughs> doctor, well, while you're bandaging there, I want to talk to this wounded man. That is, if he's well enough to talk. Yes, I think he's... I think it'll be all right, Inspector. He's in the next room, right through that door. Thanks. And, Doctor... See, the bear here does what you tell him. If you don't make him go to bed, he'll be out riding his beast this afternoon. <laughs> well, don't worry. I'll see that that doesn't happen. Well, young fellow, how are you? Oh, what's it for you? Who are you, anyhow? Who do you suppose? A uh, dick. Well, yes, that is a police officer. Yeah? Well, what do you want? What's your name? Oh, uh, Smith. John Smith. Rather unusual name, isn't it? Oh, don't make a smart attack, the cop. What do you want? Well, I want to find out who your partners were and your little deal this morning. Mama don't know. You don't know, eh? That's what I say. I'm only met him in the first of the square yesterday. I don't know what he's doing. Very, very interesting. Oh, yeah? Well, that's to the fact. They make a date to meet me this morning near the bank. I don't know that he was going to make him stick up until she's happened. You ought to be a little more careful about the companions you take. They may get you into trouble sometime. Oh, uh, yeah. You're the wise guy, aren't you? Huh? Three means to be seen. But I can tell you this, John Smith. Our fingerprint man will be over here in a half hour, and it won't be long until we find out just how wise a guy you are. <laughs> printing of the dead bandit and his wounded companion identify them as Rudolph Slanter and Anthony Caspar, respectively. Both had served time in the Illinois State Penitentiary at Joliet for bank robbery. And Rudolph Slanter had also served four other sentences. The warden of Joliet Prison furnishes complete criminal records of both men. And in addition, sends the Los Angeles Police Department fingerprints and photographs of Ed Slanter, brother of the dead bandit. A checkup of the acquaintances of the gang brings the two short time lady friends of the men into the investigation. We understand you girls were acquainted with Ed and Rudolph Franca and Tony Casper. Mm -hmm. uh, we never heard of them. Well, they may have given you different names. Here are the pictures. You recognize them? You can speak freely. All we want is an identification. We haven't got anything on you. You're damn right you haven't. Well... Do they look like anyone you ever saw before? Mm. Sure, we was out with them one night. Yeah. 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 all right. Sure they did. But I'm not going to get into any jam on account of them. Well, go on. Well, we was out with them. They said they were from Chicago, and they were going to pull a big job the next day. Was that the day the Hellman Bank was robbed? Yeah, I guess it was. See, that's right, Ella. Remember one of them made a crack about having a date with his banker the next morning? I don't know anything about it. I'm through with you. Throwing your guts to a cop. You got us all wrong, sister. All we want is a corroborative identification. Well, I don't care what you want. You're a copper, and you ain't going to get nothing out of me. With his record from Joliet and the further identification of his girlfriend, Caspar admits his participation in the robbery, but refuses to give any information regarding the two missing bandits. Pictures and fingerprints of Ed Planter are printed by the thousands and sent to every police station and sheriff's office in the United States. More than two months passed. And then one November afternoon at a busy corner of the loop in Chicago, patrolman Frank Griffin, off duty and in plain clothes, recognizes a man answering the description of Ed Planter talking to two other men. As Griffin approaches the group, the two men flee. 
But Planter reaches for a gun in his hip pocket. Griffin seizes Planter, pinning his arms to his body. Don't be a trap, Planter. Look at that crowd. Don't start anything. Well, what's the big idea? Quiet, listen. They want to talk to you down at headquarters. If you come along quietly, I won't handcuff you. Yeah, but I... If you raise hell to try to get away, this crowd may be tougher on you than I'll be. Well, okay. Come on, then. You might tell me, Griffin, what the big idea is. Nothing much. Only the captain wants to talk to you. What about? A bank robbery in Los Angeles. Los Angeles? I've never been in Los Angeles. Well, you can explain all that to the captain. I'm through with you when I get you down to headquarters. Hey, how come you're in plain clothes, Griffin? You was in harness a couple of days ago. Yeah, well, I... I got promoted. Yeah? Sure. Can you get on the inside now, huh? Yeah, that's right. There's your pal Shields on the corner. <laughs> He's still in the harness. Yeah, but you will get a break, too, one of these days. Hello, Frank. Who's your pal? Joe, this fellow's wanted for murder. There's a gun in his pocket. Get it. Okay. Now, I'll lie you, though. Give me the bracelet, Joe. Hey, what the... <laughs> now, Ed, I'm still a harness bull, but I happen to be off duty right now and without a gun. Good <laughs> job, Frank. I got the SOS you flashed with your eyes. Boy, was I nervous. I thought I'd never run into anybody. Well, I'll be a platoon here. I could have got away all the time. Oscar Bayer, now promoted to the detective force, accompanies Captain James Bean to Chicago. And the two officers bring Edward Planter back to Los Angeles to face trial on charges of first-degree murder and robbery. In December 1925, Caspar, now sufficiently recovered from his wound, and Planter go on trial before a jury of 12 women, the first all-female jury in the history of California. For 83 hours, the ladies of the jury argue the case, 11 standing for hanging and 12, and the 12th set upon for acquittal. Finally, at a few minutes before 12 on New Year's Eve, they compromise on life in prison. With New Year's bells ringing and whistles screeching, the jury returns its verdict. The attorney for the defense leads to his feet. Your Honor, this is a miscarriage of justice. I will appeal this decision. Are we to work? I believe that a second trial was the result of these men getting what they actually deserve. They should be sentenced to hang. Well, uh, in that case, will the court permit me a moment to speak to my client? Yes, certainly. Your Honor, upon further consideration, I and my clients are prepared to accept the verdict of the jury and the sentence of the court. <laughs> Shortly afterwards, Ed Planter and Tony Caspar are en route to Folsom Prison. The fourth bandit was never apprehended, but police vigilance has not relaxed in the search for him. Oscar Bayer, in reward for his bravery, received a citation from Chief Davis, a promotion to the Detective Bureau, and a share of a $2,300 reward given by the Hellman Bank and the California Bankers Association. This brave officer who had escaped death many times before he foiled the bank robbers, who had battled with German U-boats in the English Channel during the war, was a member of the Pursuit Squadron 478 of the Army Reserve Force, having learned to pilot an airplane following the war. He sold the first ship he owned, an old Jenny, to a boy in Alhambra, who killed himself crashing into high-tension wires. Bayer's second ship ran out of gas over the downtown police station and crashed at Vermont and Third. Bayer escaped with a few scratches. Unafraid, Bayer buys a monocoupe. And one bright, sunshiny day in 1929, he takes off from Rogers Airport, accompanied by officer's passenger, for a short hop to Clover Field in Santa Monica. A few minutes later, the glistening red ship drops on the Clover Field in a perfect three-point landing. And Bayer is greeted by a friend whom he has been teaching to fly. Hello, Johnson. Hello, Oscar. Well, days are flying, huh? Yeah. You know my pal, Pussinger? Oh, hi. Yeah, hi. Well, what about it, Johnson? You want to take another lesson? Sure. You know, Pussinger, 
This guy can teach me more about handling a stick in five minutes than any of these other birds can in a day. Yeah, Oscar knows his stuff, all right. Come on, you guys. This battery's going to my head. Come on, let's go, Johnson. Okay. So long, Bush. Be back in a little while. Okay, Oscar. So long. Letting the chemical red bird skims across the green of the air drone, sees the top of the glass, and falls toward the heavens. Circling effortlessly, it is soon a thousand feet in the air. Below lies the panorama of Southern California, a glimmering jewel in the noonday sun. The mountains to the east, the desert beyond shimmering in the east. Below the matchless blue of Santa Monica Bay, half circled by the throbbing white scallop of the beach. Toward the west, the mysterious peaks of the Channel Islands. A day to dream. A day to soar. A shout goes up from the field. The monarch who falters in his flight turns over, walks into a spin, hurtles earthward. Down! Down! Bear two days later. A 116 motorcycle policeman from all over Los Angeles County accompanied the procession. Aeroplanes flew overhead. We fired three volleys above the grave, and the plane swooped low, dropping wreaths of flowers on the last we saw of Oscar Bayer. An officer and a gentleman, a fearless enemy, a faithful friend, truly one of the finest. Thank you, Chief Davis. Police records by Madeline Kelly and was adapted for radio and produced.